Hello, my name is David Martinez, and today I'm going to tell you about the scooter accident I had in Taiwan. I'm Rolf Potts. I'm going to talk about getting drugged and robbed in Istanbul. I swear it's not as terrifying as it sounds, but I'd like you to avoid it just the same. Another thing that often comes up when I talk about travel is uh, bad things that happen when you travel. You know, bad things can happen. It's dangerous. I think often uh, we hear a story, we'll hear something like, uh, you know, for instance, in Turkey some years ago, not Turkey, uh, Morocco some years ago, two tourists were beheaded. Hmm. And that was, that, can, that made the news and it was, and it, it's scary. And so then it becomes kind of scary to travel to Morocco. Don't go to Morocco because you're going to be beheaded. And I was in Mexico recently and the conversation was around kidnapping. I took my 11 year old daughter and it's like, don't go to Mexico because your daughter's going to be kidnapped. And so I find myself having conversations with students often about the dangers of traveling. I imagine you've had these similar conversations. You've traveled all over the world. Do people come, come to you with the same fears? It's often the first question they ask, you know, fears. Money is a big one, but then fear is another one. And there's there's so many things to be afraid of. And But we also live in a media environment that Clickbait is a new word, but the old phrase was man bites dog. You know, the, the story about a dog biting a man isn't going to make the news because it happens all the time. But if a man bites a dog, well, that's a news story, right? So it's always the weird and the crisis driven stories that make it to the top of our headline feed or our social media feed or the headlines in the traditional media we read. And so it's no wonder that we're worried about that, that sort of thing, um, you know, my mom was always worried about where I was going to go. And like her family said, I don't know, why is Rolf going to China? You know, don't, don't Chinese people, you know, hate Americans or whatever. I mean, I think there's a, a lot of reasons to fear. And so I try to discourage people from getting too caught up in the fears, but encourage people also to be realistic because bad things happen to all of us. And in fact, oftentimes a bad thing or one way to justify a bad thing happening is you're, you're pushing your comfort zone a little bit. I think oftentimes... Some scams will happen in a tourist zone. You're not really pushing your comfort zone, but somebody who's really just good at a scam is going to get some money from you in the place where all the tourists go. But then some, you know, odds are sometime you'll get a little bit sick or you might have some sort of an accident. I will point out that apart from the scams, most of the bad things that can happen to you as a traveler are sort of the same things that would happen to you back home. Um, that often, you know, statistically, um, swimming can be dangerous if you're not familiar with the waters. Uh, renting a... A motorbike uh, and riding around can be dangerous if you don't know the roads. Uh, and then sicknesses, it, it, it's easy to keep track of and it's good to create um, good nutrition and cleanliness habits. But odds are, if you travel long enough, you'll get sick somehow. You touched on the three main ones, right? Yeah. Scams, uh, accidents, and um sickness yeah. and eating something that you, yeah, and all three of those have happened to me for sure. Uh, but you're right. I think, you know, I, my response often is, you know, if you listen to the news and what's happening in the United States and Detroit or New York or LA or San Francisco or wherever, whatever other city, you don't, you don't even, you, you would never consider not going to those cities. You would just kind of assume that there are certain parts of the city or that, the, you know, it doesn't happen all the time. And I encourage them to think of it in the same way, you know, like Morocco, things happen in different parts of the country and, and you, and you should still travel and go there. But it, with, uh, and with accidents, the same thing, you know, obviously we could have car accidents here. I, when I was living in Taiwan, I had a, a you know, we, I had a scooter. That's how we, we get around a Vespa, you know, this little, um, what do you call them? Tiny motorcycles? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Vespa. Mopeds. Yeah. Scooter. Mopeds, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I loved it. I didn't love my accident. I loved getting around on, on this little moped. Uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. Red lights, about 50% of them stop and the other 50% kind of like run right through it. And so you kind of, you kind of get good at understanding that you're in charge of what's right in front of you. Hmm. And so what, what, what that does is if, if you see a scooter coming this way, you are the one who you, you have to kind of move off to the side a little bit because they're in charge of this. They're not going to, you know, if they're merging with you, they're not going to see you. And so you mm -hmm. kind of get used to. So it's funny when I was, when I visited the U.S. after living in Taiwan and I came up on a, you know, on a four-way street and the car was coming up, I kind of swerved to the left, you know, it's a little in that mode in, in Taiwan. But my accident happened because uh, I, I was, I stopped at the, at the red light. It turned, it turned uh, green 
And I looked over to make sure that nobody was running the red light. Hmm. Okay, so hmm. I'm looking, making sure nobody's running the red light. Nobody's running the red light. Okay, good. I'm going to go forward. This guy was going the wrong way and running a red light. Right. Just collide. He was on a, on a moped as well. Our mopeds collide. I went flying in the air. The moped was in pieces on the road. And, and I got up and I knew how to say a couple of words. One of the words I knew how to say was why. Right. Way shama. Right. It's like, way right. shama, way right. shama. And, right. and, and he was very apologetic. He was, there were two of them on the, on the, on their scooter. And he came up and said, how much, how much for the scooter? And I said, it cost, it had cost me about a hundred dollars. And then I said, a hundred dollars. And he's like, okay, come with me. My wife was on her scooter behind me. So I hopped on her scooter and we went to his house and he came down with a hundred dollars and paid for the Whoa. scooter. That was the extent of the, of the accident, you know? Huh. And we had a great time at that point. We were laughing, laughing it off, you know, but that was the, that was a quote unquote, bad thing that happened mm -hmm. abroad, it could have been a lot worse. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are some, some really bad accidents. Um, but I would never uh, advise somebody, you know, don't go to Taiwan because you're going to have a scooter accident. You know, don't go to Taiwan because you're going to have an accident. Uh, in fact, you often say like the, these misadventures, these bad things that happen make for far better stories than, you know, like nothing ever happened to me in Taiwan. Yeah. I think that, um, well, I think there's a lot of rules like driving defensively. We learned this in driver's ed class. Um, and I had a, a similar, very similar in many levels, a uh, motorcycle accident in Sri Lanka, the same situation where if you let your guard down and you forget that the rules in your head aren't necessarily being, be, uh, you know, Followed. done in the road, then you can end up having an accident as I did there. And it was no fun. But then also wear your helmet. I know those rental helmets make you look like a dork, but just wear your helmet because that could save your life. Uh, drive defensively. Um, when, like, when, if you're swimming on a beach that you're not familiar with, either see if there are lifeguards or have a friend around because nobody wants to go out for a 400 meter swim that ends up being a 12 mile being sucked out to sea situation. And then also like nightlife in, in a given city on the other side of the world, have the same sorts of instincts that you would in a big city at home. You know, after after a night on the town at the club and you're walking home at two in the morning, maybe you should spend a little extra money and get a taxi. Or maybe you should just be aware, have some situational awareness. That goes a long way. It's not going to be a silver bullet that means you're never going to have a negative experience overseas. But um, just be smart. Don't, don't be so romantically um, besotted with your travels that you just let your safety down. Your accident in Sri Lanka, your motorcycle accident, I've seen the picture. You mm -hmm. were pretty beat up. Yeah, yeah. What happened? Um, it's, it, it's a long story, but I, much like you, I got hit by someone who was driving in a way that was not predictable at all. Um, and it knocked me out. You know, I was wearing a helmet and it sort of um, gave me a shiner and gave me some stitches in my chin. Uh, and it ended up being fine and I'm glad I was wearing my helmet. But again, I was not, what I, how I assumed traffic would work on that road didn't quite work out the way that it did. And it was, it was not fun at all. Uh, I feel really lucky to have only gotten out with a, a shiner and some stitches. But again, it's, it's just, you have to be 300% more careful in a place where maybe the traffic is on the other side of the road. Maybe the unspoken rules of traffic, especially on motorcycles, are just a lot more fluid than they would be uh, in a place like the United States. Yeah. Um, You're yeah. wearing a full, a full hel helmet. Like mm -hmm. full, but yeah. it, I was wearing, it, it was a rental helmet. So I have a pretty big noggin. And so it, I don't think it fit really well. I, I was, my peripheral vision wasn't as good as it could have been. Uh, and so while, while the helmet uh, was helpful for sure, um, I think it also, that's another thing to consider that if you get a helmet and it doesn't fit well and you can't see very well, ask for another helmet, you know, yeah. and I'm not, I'm not, what happened happened. I'm not going to Monday morning qu quarterback my, my crash, but that was another situation that could have helped that, that, that basically take the safety precautions, even if it means asking for another helmet or wearing a helmet that looks really dumb, but yeah. could save your life. Yeah. It's funny. You meant, I, not funny that you mentioned it, but that, that, that is super important. And that was a conversation in Taiwan as well, because you had these, these helmets that were kind of like only at the top of your head, didn't cover mm -hmm. any of your face. Mm -hmm. And for a while, that's what I, that's what I wore. And my wife would, you know, pleading with me to, to get a better helmet where she wore the full, you know, had when she herself had a, had a scooter accident. It, it's, it, it, they're, they're frequent. It rains a lot there. And so you end up skidding out a lot. Uh, but there was an, uh, an American an English teacher who, uh, the weather was bad and he ran into a car and it was 
badly hurt. He was mm. in the hospital for a number of months. Goodness. And so, yeah, bad things. So I agree with with everything you're saying. Um, drive defensively, take extra precautions, uh, even if it feels fun, you know, to go full throttle, you yeah. know, on these on these roads. I remember driving into Egypt too. Like the rules just seem so different you know lanes don't really mean anything and mm -hmm. you're gonna but there is there's an internal structure or not an, an internal system to the way traffic works in each country and it's different and it's mm -hmm. going to be very very different from here uh in the united states where we the pedestrian always has a right of way that those kinds of things you know school buses right, right. when the school bus stops like the whole world stops you know and i think and I, I'm all about protecting kids, but I do think we're doing them a disservice because as soon as they travel to the rest of the world, the world doesn't stop when you when you leave a bus, you know, when you walk out of a out of a bus. But uh, kids, the, the other thing you mentioned, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, just as an aside, kids too have so much more responsibilities. Like you'll you'll be in India, and the 12 year old is like has 10 cows that he's leading down the street, <laughs> and they're, they're just such adult competence in so many parts of the world that kids who are understandably sheltered here. Suddenly you go overseas and it's like someone who's half your kid's age is doing something that you'd be scared to do. Yeah, that happens too with walking to school. In Germany, it's not uncommon to see kindergartners or first graders walk into school by themselves mm. from their house to the school. Uh, whereas here, you know, sometimes if, if that were to happen, the cops might be called on mm. you. You know, what are yeah. you doing letting your kid um, on, on their own? You talked also about sickness. That's another thing that, that comes up. Uh, I remember in, in, on the Amazon, I got really sick. Uh, diarrhea happens right. <laughs> it's, that's not not uncommon and i i was so sick that i was i'm not going to say delusional but i was imagining things and uh you know i remember i was laying on the hammock and uh you know other people on on similar hammocks and i remember like seeing limbs you know i come out of these hammocks and i was envisioning kind of monsters right i was just in the mm -hmm. state there was a, a a rope up on the somewhere on the ceiling and I remember thinking there was a snake and I was kind of kind of watching it, making sure that it wasn't going to come um, and I suppose bite me or I don't know, otherwise kill me. Um, but that's another thing that, that happens. And I, I still, even though I had this horrible experience and most of the places I've traveled to have been a little sick of you know, nausea, na, na, nausea and so forth. Rarely am I full on diarrhea throwing up, but it has happened. But even then I don't, this is not a reason not to travel. Um, right? Yeah. <laughs> Am I wrong? <laughs> yeah, no. And then uh, that's another thing. We get sick at home all the time. Yeah. It's probably less fun to get sick overseas, especially when you feel like it's cutting into your, your dream trip a little bit. But actually sickness can be a part of that. And it, it can be humbling too. You know, um, there's almost a spiritual aspect of not being fully bodily present. You know, you're, you're sort of forced to compensate and, and realize your own limitations. Um, and I think, like traveler's diarrhea is just a badge that you've left home. Um, <laughs> it is avoidable, but I think it would be sad if you completely, if you always completely avoided it, because sometimes it's something that happens that you're eating food that is different. It's spicier. It, it's ingredients are uh, unfamiliar to your stomach. And so you might be a little bit sick early on, but gosh, what a, what a small price to pay for the amazingness of those new foods and the new travel. Um, yeah, uh, I actually have, I had uh, cholera once, not something I recommend anybody get, but I remember being in the hospital and sort of being hallucinatory and thinking, I just need to tie a rope to my toes and put it over a pulley. And if I pull myself up to the ceiling, then I'll feel better. <laughs> it was just completely delusional sick person thinking that was, I, I, I got that, uh, that cholera. Oh, that was malaria actually. Yeah, I've had cholera and malaria oh, in Southeast wow. Asia, which sound horrible and they're best avoided, but you know, they're, they're, it's just something that happened, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think that, yeah, this is something, it, it, it's part of the adventure. Another time in India, uh, I'd traveled around the world. I'd gotten traveler's diarrhea in, in different circumstances, but I hadn't had it for months. I just felt like nothing could live in my body anymore. My body was used to anything. Well, India is like the oldest culture in the world at many levels. Like the, the cultures in, in their food are just unlike any you find elsewhere in the world. And so being an American and being a little nervous about the, the, the emergency room and how much it might cost, I avoided for like two days suffering with traveler's diarrhea. I staggered to the hospital on day three. The doctor looked at me, rolled his eyes when I told him what my problem was, gave me a prescription. The doctor's consultation and the medicine cost a dollar and 35 cents. I still remember this to this day, that I had been avoiding the doctor just because I was afraid to pay for what turned out to be extraordinarily cheap. 
And that can be a part of the adventure too, going to a pharmacy, going to a doctor. Um, that is also counts as a travel experience and can be very interesting and memorable. This is the tail end of a misadventure when you get sick and you and you you transport with you these ideas of a very costly and expensive visit hmm. to the hospital where most places around the world are going to be competent, they're going to be good, they're going to know in in many ways better, right? You know, because they're they deal with this all the time. Um, certain sicknesses especially if foreigners come in. But yeah, it's just going to be a lot cheaper. And that's that's it comes as a shock to to a lot of people. I remember there was this I was I took a group of students to Spain and uh, one of the students, their mother came and, and visited and the mother uh, stepped off a curb or something, broke her leg in like two parts. You know, it was a really bad um, break. And she was in the hospital for several days and kind of worried and nervous about the bill. And the bill ended up being a couple hundred dollars hmm. or something. And she was just floored. And, and um, you know, you have to get into socialized medicine or not. Right. This is really where we're with what the topic is. But it's interesting how an experience like that can then um, lead you to other, you know, ways of thinking about how, how medicine works in, in the United States. But in terms of, of misadventures abroad, that's, that's a big one. Sickness, disease, uh, scams, uh, trusting people is another one. That's, that's a tough one because I encourage people, um, students when they travel or anybody, when they travel to meet people, that's going to be, uh, a very rewarding and beautiful experience. You're going to come back and talk about, here's my picture with the Eiffel Tower and so forth. But that's uh, anecdotal, you know, the person that you met, on the travel. And it could be uh, a French person, but it could also be an expatriate, also traveling, you know, Australians who take these two to three year trips because they can't, you know, they, they often can't take these couple week trips. They have to take this long, long, um, long-term travel, right? Uh, you meet them and, and that's, and that becomes a part of your, your story and your travel adventure. But there are also people who are trying to you know, rob you and do bad things to you. You've had an experience like this. Was it Turkey? Yeah, in Turkey, I was I was befriended by guys who identified themselves as Moroccans. I think they may have been Moroccans, actually. And it was actually a scam that was talked about in the guidebook. I just hadn't read that page of the guidebook. And they befriend you, and then they slip a, uh, you know, a, a rohypnol, uh, a sleeping pill of sorts, date rape drug, into uh, usually a drink. And they offered me a beer, but I, I didn't, really want a beer, but they offered me a cookie and I was thinking, Ooh, that looks good. And so I ate a little sandwich cookie that had a drug in it and it knocked me out and they took everything I had. And, um, almost by nature of the scam, they don't want to, people to get hurt or killed or then the police will pay more attention to this. And so it was in a certain sense, it was harmless, but I ended up like sleeping in outside that night. And I had this crazy misadventure that of course was in my second book, Marco Polo didn't go there because misadventures are always, um, more, have more inherent narrative conflict than uh, a happy experience. Um, but that's a terrifying story. This is why people don't travel yeah. because mm -hmm. it's like the big mm -hmm. fear. Like somebody's going to befriend me, drug me, take everything I have, beat me up. I'm going to end up in a bathtub with ice and they're right. going to take my kidney. Well, I think too, like your instincts really are something you should follow. And I think this was a situation, it, it was male privilege at work. If I was a woman, there's no way I would have hung out with these guys. Um, uh, so I just, I'd been traveling for almost two years full time and I was just a little bit cocky. And I was, and also I was sort of looking for, for stories. Not that I literally got robbed <laughs> for the story that ended up in my second book, but I just, I was a little bit cavalier about things. And so a good rule of thumb in these situations, you know, you don't want to be paranoid, but oftentimes in tourist zones, which is where these guys found me, the Sultanahmet region of, of Istanbul, the scammers are going to collect there. It's not worth their financial interest to go to some place where no other travelers are. They're going to, they're going to run their scams in tourist areas. And the rule of thumb is, if it's a situation you would feel uncomfortable with at home, you should probably not feel too comfortable with it there. Because if someone's way too friendly in an area with a ton of tourists, that's a little bit of a red flag. Because are they going to sell me something or are they going to scam me? And again, you don't want to be paranoid, but why are they befriending me when there's 500 other tourists in this square? Mm -hmm. Whereas if somebody approaches you in some other neighborhood where tourists never go, that might seem suspicious, but it's probably less likely to be suspicious because there's no economy in tricking tourists. They're probably just curious about you. Mm -hmm. And you get better as you go. Although I just stated that after two years, I've somehow managed to get drugged and robbed in Istanbul. Um, but yeah, just use your instincts. Again, mind you, where you are in, in your neighborhoods, mind times of day um, when walking in cities, 
don't get lost when you're in the country. You know, don't get turned around and suddenly be walking through a forest that you're not familiar with. Use your common sense. And really it's the same common sense that you practice when you're at home. It goes a long way. And I think everybody has some sort of negative misadventure story, which again are good to write about, but um, they're usually pretty minor. They're, they're, they're usually just a rough spot in an otherwise very positive experience. I know statistics don't do a lot to convince people because a story like that, I can I can see a lot of re- a lot of listeners, you know, they listen to this and they say, "This is why I don't travel. This is why I don't. I will never go to Turkey right. ever again." But that's not your advice. You do you advise people to go to Turkey. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'd like to go back. I'd like to properly go back someday because I feel like I had just gotten into Turkey and this thing happened and I had to leave. And, and of course, Turkey contains multitudes. You know, there's, right. there's a coastal part um, of Turkey that's very different from the mountainous part. I think Mount Ararat from the Bible is in Turkey. Um, there's just so many different varieties of experiences that you can experience in one country that have nothing to do with getting drugged and robbed. Um, yeah, my experience, I... I've had some things happen to me, robbed in Brazil and so forth, but I overwhelmingly people want to help. They, they're they so excited you're there. They want to, they're, they love that you want to learn about their culture, mm. their language, and overwhelmingly the experience is a, is a positive one. But, you know, you do have these handful of people who are out to, to, to do no good as it were. But as you're right, it, that also happens in, in the United States. I, one of your quotes in The Vagabond's Way, you have these little quotes at the, at the top of the book. And one of my favorite ones, I forget who, who said it or who wrote it, but uh, it's something like, I've been to over a hundred con- uh, over hundred countries in the span of my life. And I've been almost killed three times, all three in, in the United States. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's Henry Rollins, actually, okay. the, the old black flag musician, the old punk rocker from uh, the United States. And He's an amazing traveler. After t- living in a van and traveling around as a rock musician, he just decided to go vagabonding for years. And he has some really funny stories, but but that's true that his, um, and I, I've also heard people say that, yeah, I traveled around the world and I got food sickness in McDonald's when I got home <laughs> to the United States. You know, uh, that that's actually an anomalous. I think food sickness is just something that happens to people from time to time. But, sure. but um, yeah, we forget sometimes that the, the reason... Yeah, even at home, there's dangers. We, we sort of learn how to navigate them at home, but sometimes we we avoid dangers at home by doing something boring, like sitting at home and watching TV instead of going across town. Not that it's dangerous to go across town, but that's another thing too, is that um, sometimes you can sort of do your training reels travel by going to the Cambodian restaurant across town or seeing if there's a Sri Lankan cricket league in the public park or something. And then you sort of Actually, yeah, the, you realize that, yeah, actually Sri Lankan people are getting sick too sometimes. And, and that this is, it's not something that's singling you out as a traveler. It's just how life is sometimes. There's another uh, category, I guess, which is uh, fights. Uh, you know, I avoid fights at all costs. Uh, I don't have enough pride. You know, if, if as I suppose if I were offended or somebody who calls me something, I, I, I'm not one to quickly defend my honor. So I, I walk away. I've been very fortunate. That was a situation in Brazil where we, there was almost a fight and we, we left as, as quickly as we could. And a few other situations that I've escaped, I, w- I wouldn't say narrowly, um, but that's another fear that people have and misadventures when you're running into people, kind of similar to uh, people scamming you, drugging you, and then robbing you. There's this fear of getting into some kind of altercation and then having some kind of fist fight. Have you have you encountered any of this or do you also run away from fights? Well, absolutely, the, the rule of thumb is run away um, because even, even if it doesn't involve you, um, anytime there's about there's a protest that's getting a little bit rowdy, you don't need to stand there and watch it because it, it's not about you. Um, like once uh, some friends and, and, and I were in Korea, some American friends, and we saw a woman, uh, a guy slapping his wife around and we tried to get him to stop. Well, nobody on the street saw a guy slapping his wife quite like they saw a bunch of American guys trying to hold him back from his wife. And so it was really ugly situation. We we were, our best intention was to stop a guy being abusive to his wife. When in fact, the people on the street just saw like these tall American guys sort of shoving at this Korean guy. And that's where the story started for them. And so no good came of that. Um, you don't want to see domestic violence in the street, but it wasn't our job to to step in because it just created a story that we had no idea was going to play out of this situation, that everybody right. on the street thought we were picking on this guy when in fact we were just trying to keep him from being mean to his wife. Yeah, I remember at a soccer game one time, a fight broke out and, and I just went to the sideline and just sat down and kind of watched it. I, there was no way I was getting in there. I did, it just wasn't, it wasn't for me. There's just never enough 
there, there's never enough motivation for me to get into it. I wonder what it would take. I, I, I imagine some kind of danger to my kids, perhaps, or something like that. But there's very little that's going to cause me to get in the middle of a fight. And there's another category, which is, you know, we talk about misadventures. This is when things go a bit too far. But there's also, there's that line, because you don't want to be, as you mentioned, too comfortable. Like, this, I'm going to stay in my house on my couch because something bad might happen. But there's also, I remember in, in the Amazon, I jumped into the river in the middle of nowhere. The boat kind of stopped and I jumped in because I thought it would be fun. That could have very quickly turned into a misadventure where, I'm mauled by something or there's a lot of animals in the Amazon. Um, but how do you navigate that sort of in the middle? Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go outside my comfort zone. I'm going to push the envelope, but I don't want to go too far. I don't want to die. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, common sense goes a long way and unfamiliar roads and water are always worth taking a second thought about, you know, because Oops. sure you can jump in the river at home, but the, you know, the Amazon is not the Willamette, right? <laughs> right. There's going to be, including currents, um, that, that you could find a whirlpool, um, could, could really compromise your day, if not your life in, in a way that you might not even think about. And so, you talk about this, the number one cause of death is water. Is that yeah. am I, am I correct? It, it's water and, and people who go to the beach on their moped without a helmet, have a couple beers and then don't make bad judgments and crash their motorcycle. I say that sort of with jocularity, but that's that can be a serious problem and it's not worth it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think even asking local people, if you don't see local people swimming in this river, they might know something about it that you don't, right? right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and in general, that goes good for, if you're not seeing a lot of, people walking the, through this neighborhood at two in the morning, maybe you shouldn't be the only person walking through this neighborhood. Um, and that, that this applies to beggars, all sorts of things. See how the local people are treating a given situation and that right. including fights. And that is a good way to, um, to modulate your own behavior. Yeah. Seeking adventure is important. Uh, there's a great book that I, I haven't quite finished it yet, but it's an anthology, a different story. It's called the irresponsible traveler. You have a story in there yeah, as yeah. well. I haven't read your story yet, but I like it because it's equal parts, uh, what I've read so far, it's equal parts, uh, people encountering difficult situations, how they navigate it. And it can be it, it can be a way of reading about these crazy stories, being amazed by them, but it could also be a learning experience. You know, how, how would you react in these situations? How would you get out of it? And so I think it's a great, it's a great read to get you, to inspire you to travel, also be aware of the bad things that can happen. But still continue to travel. That's, I think, what I want to stress. You got a recommendation? A book recommendation about misadventures. Well, uh, my book, Marco Polo, didn't go there, as which we've, is one as of my we've favorite mentioned. Books, yeah. as, uh, the story of me getting drugged and robbed, which is not fun at the time, but gosh, it makes, I wrote it like a whodunit, you know. <laughs> um, and gosh, I might fall back in, in another one of our conversations. We talked about the Traveler's Tales books. They have anthologies that, um, well, actually, there's a Lonely Planet one called By the Seat of My Pants, which is very similar to the Brat book you were talking about. And Traveler's Tales also has these, these misadventures. They have some sort of funny books. I think it's called Sand in My Broads about women's uh, travel misadventures. Just the idiosyncrasies that happen to you in this particular situation uh, as a woman traveler. Um, yeah, again, misadventures make for great stories. They um, do. Yeah. When I was teaching my Paris class this summer, um, like this kid who had basically spent all his money to take, the, to take the class, couldn't find a place to stay through Airbnb or couch surfing or hostels. Everything was full. And so he went to like this special page of couch surfing, but it was only for nudists. <laughs> and so he had to make the decision, am I going to be naked in some stranger's house in Paris for a week? And when he shared this with the class the first day of the week, it's like, you just you just hit the jackpot. That's a, <laughs> gonna make a great story someday. That's awesome. Shall we spin the globe? Let's spin it. Oh my gosh. I almost landed on Kansas, which is where I live. <laughs> it's probably Oklahoma. Um, but it actually made me think uh, about how our travels are incremental. You know, I didn't have a passport till I was 25 years old. When I was a kid, going to Oklahoma was really exciting. Going to Colorado was really exciting. And I think it's, it's good not to be a snob about this. I often talk about international travel because my travels have gone in that direction. But my first big vagabonding trip was living in a van and traveling in the United States with a, with a George Fox friend. And um, that's a good thing to honor. In, in, in my book, The Vagabond's Way, I talk about going on, my dad was a science teacher, going on field trips with him in Kansas to places that weren't exotic, but he knew the landscape so well um, that it was really fun. And it's sort of helped me, having grown up in a non-tourist part of the United States has helped me 
learn to recognize subtlety. Yeah. Sometimes the most obvious attraction is what everybody's looking at, but the most interesting attraction is what you didn't notice at first glance. Absolutely. I'll second that as well. I, I've done two trips across the country. One was, I think it was five or six weeks. It was more of a climbing trip. We left from uh, with a buddy, uh, buddy from Tennessee to Colorado, and then we kind of hung out in, in Wyoming. And uh, I, we may have driven through Oklahoma. Uh, I've been to Oklahoma for sure. Uh, but I, I agree. I think those, the United States is so big, so different. You know, San Francisco is, is very different from, I don't know, Birmingham, Alabama or, or other, other uh, cities. And there's lots of adventures to be had. Uh, as you're, if you're a climber, camping, hiking, the United States does national parks, uh, state parks so well. And, uh, and then you encounter people and you're going to encounter strange people around the world. You're going to encounter strange people in the United States. And so, yeah, travel, travel internationally, there's a, there's a glamour to it, Paris, the, you know, whatever restaurants and types of food, but there's also excitement to be had taking this this um, high, was it highway one up the coast of, oh of God, the, the big the Sur Pacific. in California. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's amazing. Um, or even, you know, even stepping into Canada, you know, it can be a, a sort of Vancouver, north of, north of Vancouver, lots to be done. So yeah, I, I think a trip across the United States, everybody should do it. You talk about, you can only travel the United States when you're 23 once. Yeah. And everybody should do that. Hop yeah. in your van and just sleep in the van. Or we, we slept on top of the van. We are, car was so packed with gear that we we ended up mostly most of the time in national parks or sleeping on the street or on the road. one time we we pulled off the side of the highway and just slept on the road there hmm. it, that probably wasn't the smartest thing to do and these semis coming down you know and uh, i don't recommend that hmm. but i think it's a great it's a great way to get started and again yeah it's a great way to to see new places meet new people try new things and and yeah be careful most of the time this video podcast is a production of George Fox Digital. To find more material like this, you can subscribe to George Fox Talks on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. Our team really appreciates your feedback in the form of likes, comments, and reviews, and we'd really love to hear what you think. To sign up for our weekly email list and to keep up to date with the latest episodes and publications, you can check us out on the web at georgefox.edu talks. Thank you for listening. And we'll see you in the next episode.